Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, did we get one last late person? Hey, uh, welcome to uh, Content is King Under the Mountain, bringing our offline knowledge content, or our content to offline environments. Um, I am, I'm Jared Sprague, uh, Senior Principal of Software Engineer at Red Hat, um, working on the on Project Mimir, which is our offline product that we're working on. And um, this is Vlastimil Elias from also, senior principal software engineer. We we work together on the same team. Um, he's architect and developer on our GraphQL platform API. Um, all right. So, what we're going to talk about today? So, we're going to talk about why do we even need to think about offline content? Um, what is and what was our solution? How we tackled uh, offline, which was which we call Pro Project Mimir. That's the code name, like internal name for our offline product that we're working on. And then we're going to talk about some patterns and tools that can be applied to any um, project where you're trying to take uh, enterprise knowledge content and bring it offline. And then we're going to talk about some of the common challenges that come up with that, with bringing content offline. All right, so first off, why, why offline? So. We have many customers that don't have internet access. This is the this is what the um, the faces on this slide represent. Um, yeah, they're they're sad because they can't get access to our docs, our knowledge base, all of this, all of the digital content that our online customers have. They can't get to it because there's well, there's a lot of reasons why. Um, they may work in secure facilities and government agencies where they don't allow internet access. Uh, they may be at, uh, on a ship in the o middle of the ocean, or they may be on uh, like the space station or something where it's limited, right? you know, like how much. So um, what we want to do is give them the same digital experiences and content that our online customers enjoy. So this is, the animation is uh, illustrating bringing our content to them so that they can use it exactly as they would online, but completely disconnected from the internet. All right, so what, speaking of content, what type of content are we talking about here? So what would they need? Um, stuff like your knowledge base, your product docs, uh, security data like CVEs, erratas, product lifecycle information. And then all of that stuff needs to be searchable because it's very, it's a huge amount of content. Um, so they need to be able to search it too to find what they're looking for. But that search also has to be offline. All right, so and then, so what are some of the use? I showed like just a high level, but what are some of the use cases of why you would need offline? The very, the first most obvious one are governments. Government agencies have often have disconnected network centers, uh, sites where they deal with classified, top secret information, and there can be no internet connection to those, and all the all the terminals in there have to be air gapped so that are not physically even close to anything that has an internet connection. Um, and so, you know, you, this is generally the three letter acronyms like in the US, it's like the CIA and all of FBI and stuff like that. Um, that's the first most obvious case. And, and we have a lot of customers in that, in that space called in the public sector. Um, and just really quickly, the people in those spaces today, like before we started bringing them offline content, was they could still get to it, but they, it was very painful. Like they would have to, if they're working on Red Hat or RHEL or something and they need to look up a doc and it's critical, they can't do it unless they have that, they would have to leave, the physically leave the site, go to the nearest Starbucks or whatever, get on Wi-Fi, look at the doc, maybe memorize it, and then go back in. And then and it was just like, so they, it's not that they didn't have the content. It was just extremely painful for them to get it, to get to it. Um, I also mentioned like sea and air. Like if you're in a, in a ship at sea um, and you want, you know, like the Navy. But, oh, yeah. That was one of the one of the main ways they did it before for a long time, printing off PDFs, like big stacks of PDFs. Yeah. So again, like not very efficient, right? <laughs> uh, okay. So there's 
Other use cases beside public sector, we've got financial institutions often have secure vaults with client data. Same story with healthcare. And then there's also associates themselves who are maybe have security clearance. They need to go into uh, areas where there's no internet or they're not allowed to connect to the internet. But they still need to do their job to support our customers so they can take all of the knowledge with them without having an internet connection and be able to reference it. Or you might be this guy who just defeated smog and you want to have some, and your Wi-Fi is not that great in Airborne. So, um, by the way, he says, I'm offline in Dwarvich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so our solution is called Project Mimir. Mimir is uh, the Norse god of knowledge whose head was cut off by Odin and he carried it around with him so he could get knowledge. Same with the offline content, kind of. All right, so we had, these were the requirements we had going in. Of course, offline, it needs to be an appliance where you just turn it, you just start it and it works. Like very, like push a button and it works. That's the definition of an appliance, right? Um, and then run for long periods with no human intervention. This is critical because the customers who are using this, we can't even know who they are, let alone support them. A lot of them, are top secret, so we can't even know who the customer is. Like, like, so because of that, we can't be like, oh, if you have a problem, call us and we'll help you. That, that's not an option. So um, the final product has to be very stable um, and run without any, and, so, and also be able to get updates regularly. So here's a solution where we came up with each one of these as our, that guided our architecture. Um, we extract and transform our online, transform the online content to offline uh, as an appliance is a single container with very few moving parts. So you just run the container and it's good. Um, and to, to make it the part about very stable and no human intervention, it's a static website with a solar index. So there's very little that can actually go wrong with it because HTML and Apache, you know, it's going to just kind of sit there running forever. Um, the image and it needs to in order to like enable updates the build times and image and like ETL flow has to be extremely fast so that we can give them a uh, good performance so the, the architecture is ETL but if you, a lot of you are familiar with this extract transform load however it's on a much larger scale because it's not ETL of just like some specific data it's an entire customer portal website. The entire knowledge base, all of Red Hat product documentation, all of the versions of all the Red Hat product documentation, and all of our CVEs and errata and everything. So it's, it's ETL at a massive, massive scale. Each part of the ETL, I'll just go through this quickly. These are the main, com these are the main high level components for extracting. We're using GraphQL, which we'll, Graph last a minute we'll talk about, because um, we have many data sources to pull content that we need. The transforms have to process a massive amount of data very quickly and accurately. So we chose Rust as our transform uh, language because it's fast and it's type safe and all that stuff. All the great things you hear about Rust um, really made it a good option for, uh, for this, um, for using for our transforms. And then the load step is, uh, I said it's, it's a statically generated site running under Apache with a solar index for search, and then everything's packaged in a Podman into a single image at the end. So a little bit more about each of the phases. This is the high level architecture of the extract phase where we have the lowest level, the data sources, which are all unified and abstracted by a GraphQL layer, what Glassman was gonna talk about. Um, and then every website has static content, right? Images, um, text attachments, whatever, even PDFs. We have to download all of that stuff. And on the Red Hat customer portal, there's over 70,000 static assets. We have to download them all. So we have a Rust-based downloader that can download them extremely, very quickly, um, <laughs> extremely fast. Um, and then, so that makes up the Mimir extractors. And in the end, it, we end up with markdown files and the static files that we download. And those are the, those are the inputs into the next two 
uh, those at the top, that's the input to the next part, which is the transform. And but now I think I'm going to turn it over to Vlastimil to talk a little more about GraphQL. Okay, thanks, Jared. So at this point, uh, why GraphQL? As you see, Mimir needs uh, big data from distinct sources, and this nicely meet with another ac activity we uh, run at this time in our department, and it was building Red Hat GraphQL API. Why we started to build this API? Simply, our department develops distinct user experiences like Red Hat Customer Portal, Red Hat Developers uh, website, and many more. And these websites need data from many data sources which we have in Red Hat. And data was typically available, but uh, REST APIs was used for this, and it's not very developer, uh, developer friendly. REST API is nice, but it's not a very standard way. You can imagine under REST API, you can imagine nearly anything which uses get, put, and post. <laughs> And uh, I saw lots of REST APIs, which was very different. And it's hard to use, hard to find, even where the REST API is hosted. And there is not more standard. So you really need to learn every REST API from the beginning, how to use it, how, how to consume data, how, how to uh, handle errors, etc. So we decided that we need some better way how to support our developers developing that uh, various uh, user experiences, maybe also improve some innovation, decrease time of prototyping of new user experiences. So at this point, we decided that we would like to try build new API based on GraphQL technology. GraphQL is much better standard from this point of view because it standardized much more things than the REST API. And it also exposed data in the form of oriented graph, where you can simply connect data together and use one query to get distinct data from distinct data sources connected together as you need them. So we decided we want this unified view of our data consistent in business-oriented graph. Here is some small example of our current graph. It's not definitely complete. But you see distinct entities connected together through links, and you can simply query, uh, query them very, very easily in one request. This is some basic uh, architecture. We, we it was very clear from the beginning we can develop this GraphQL as monolith because we are a big enterprise. There are distinct teams responsible for distinct data stores, etc. So we definitely wanted that every team has some freedom to develop their part of graph. And this is when federated supergraph architecture comes to play. It's some layer on top of GraphQL itself, and it allows that uh, simply data are exposed by in form of subgraphs. So there are partial smaller graphs exposed from distinct subgraphs. These subgraphs can be developed in distinct technologies, supported by distinct teams, etc. And at, at the end, all these subgraphs uh, push their small schemas to the registry. And this is place where supergraph is built. It simply connects together all these subgraphs and expose one big graph. This final graph is exposed uh, through gateways. Simply gateways component, which gets requests from clients, complete query, and then divides it, takes data from different subgraphs, put them together, and returns them in one response. In Red Hat, we uh, operate two gateways. We have internal gateways for internal systems and external gate public gateway. The main reason for this is security. We don't want to expose complete graph with all the data to the public. So in the public gateway, we expose only part of the graph. There are definitely also other security measures on the public uh, gateway. You need DDoS protections, etc., which is not so necessary on the internal because we don't expect that 
from the Red Hat Internet Network, we will cope with DDoS attacks. GraphQL has some special security considerations. Graph is huge, and the client can theoretically ask for complete graph at, at once. So you are not able to handle this. It will at least out of memory or <laughs> systems simply. So typically, we implemented cost based uh, protection, which simply uh, each node in the graph has some cost. And when a query comes, you compute cost of the query. And if it's over some threshold, you simply don't allow this query to be executed. And for this, we also have different settings between internal and public gateway. On public gateway, we allow much smaller queries than in internal gateways. Typically, what are clients for internal gateways? It's like uh, this batch type operations, which are, for, for example, building of offline customer portal. We also have some websites which are like, like built in batches. Static pages are simply built once, of once in a time then exposed to the public in form of static pages. We have server-side rendered applications, so the servers are in internal networks, so can access this internal gateway. And public gateway is mainly uh, for client-side uh, usage. So on websites, you can have client-side code, which runs from public. In the future, we are also expecting some mobile applications or third-party services, but we are not at this point yet. Uh, as we started cooperating with Mimir, it was one of our first clients, so we learned a lot. And it, is, it also has some not typical uh, load pattern, because typically these APIs are for online clients where you have nearly constant, uh, uh, nearly constant load coming from the outside, but uh, Mimir is doing like batch processing, simply it runs once a time and do some batch processing. So, we need to cope with this kind of uh, client. So there was some performance challenges definitely uh, bound to this. So for example, we cooperated very closely with the Mimir team. Uh, for example, this GraphQL API is HTTP based. So we need to, for example, tune Mimir clients in form of keep alive, timeouts, etc. Introduce some parallelism Jared will talk about. But we definitely need to tune cost, size, uh, cost protection limits on the, that internal gateway to allow big queries coming from the Mimir. We need to, for example, tune page sizes in that queries. Simply, uh, if you are loading lists of some items, you need to paginate over them. You can load everything at, in one query. Then on subgraph levels, we did lots of resolver optimizations. Resolver is simply a component which is responsible to load the data and send them back uh, in the response. So these resolvers we implemented, for example, using data loader pattern. We did lots of entity caching to get good performance. We did lots of database query optimizations in the subgraphs. So simply we get to conclusion that it's best approach is to do one big query which returns as much as possible in one, one uh, query, really. And then if there are some additional data, you need to cache them, like entity data, to get uh, quick responses. We did lots of memory and CPU tunings for subgraphs. We really load, uh, load tested with memory queries to see how they behave, tuned memory, tuned CPUs, and autoscalers in our OpenShift deployments. But we also did some very small things, which might look small, but on that big queries, it, it's uh, definitely important to, for example, zip compress data on transit between subsystems. So for example, between subgraph and MySQL database, you can set a zip compression. And it, all these pieces like, uh, contributed to performance, which is critical for the Mimir. OK, back to me, Jared. Okay. Th thanks a lot, Blast Emil. Um, so, <clears throat> a lot of the a lot of those performance things that he was talking about um, will make uh, 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 more, like if I show you actually this slide first, 
Um, when we first started, the, uh, the time it took to extract the Red Hat K-Base was there's 130,000 solutions on the K-Base. It's a lot of pages. Um, it took about 60 minutes just doing it single threaded through GraphQL. Um, then we added parallelization, and then it, that took it down to this is the parallelization where we, instead of just doing one thread, we like take all of the solutions, break them up into equal chunks, and then extract them in parallel. Um, and that took it down to about 15 minutes to extract the entire knowledge base. Then they added all of those performance optimizations you just talked about, which took it down to six minutes to, the, to do the full extract of the K base. So like they, they, we cut it like from 60 minutes to, to like 15 minutes, and then they took it from 15 minutes to six minutes, which is really fast for the amount of content that we have to, like we have to extract. Um, so uh, now, a bit, now let's talk about transform. So once we have all of the, once we have all of the data, um, it's not gonna. If you try to like use that to build a website, it's gonna be super broken. Like because all the links are gonna be broken. There's gonna be broken content from legacy CMS systems that you're trying to like render in modern Markdown. And this is this is one very simple example of that. Um, and all of the transforms in our Project Mimi are written by my partner named Michael Clayton, um, and he he did uh, he's written a whole slew of transforms to take all, all of our online portal and make it offline uh, into. And so this is a simple example: the the legacy Markdown from Drupal seven, or we use Drupal on our CMS, uh, old 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 version of Drupal, like had weird idiosyncrasies, like you wouldn't have to put a space between the headings of a Markdown heading and then it would break. And so we'd like, well, we have to look for, we have to scan for all of those and fix them. And so there's a transform called heading hash that does that. <laughs> it just goes through like, and that's a simple example. There's a lot more like, especially with markdown tables, markdown uh, code blocks, code fences especially are really like have a lot of broken stuff, but we clean them all up so that it takes that broken old legacy content and makes it into beautiful working content, um, and that's one of the main reasons of the transforms. The other, the second half of the transforms are links, because if you're, any of you are going to be trying to do this and like take offline, online content and take it offline, you're all going to run, especially web content specifically, you're all going to have to deal with links, because anything that has like a domain, a remote domain like that xsire.com, it's going to not work at all. So you have to, that's one thing you have to deal with. You have to take all your, uh, all of your um, fully qualified like uh, static URLs and make them relative. And then on top of that, you have to deal with redirects because we all deal with redirect, like we, we take redirects for granted. You click a link, it's like 10 years old and it now lives over here. You get a 301 and you get to the right place. That's because the 301 comes from Akamai or whatever your Apache origin server is or whatever. But if you're in an offline data center, everything is self-contained. There's no like going out and finding out what a redirect is. The link that's there has to be the final link that needs to go to. So you need to apply redirects, otherwise a lot of your links are going to be broken. Because as everyone knows who's worked with web content, it doesn't take long for a website to start generating a lot of redirects. Um, so uh, we also added a little, just like a quality of life feature. If there's a if there's a link that we know for sure is going to break, like to GitHub or anything external that's not our own content, we put a strike through through it so we so we save people some time because it's guaranteed to break when they try to click on it because they don't have internet. Um, okay, so here's here's a little bit more about redirects. This is what I'm. This is showing you what I'm saying. When you first extract the content, we we counted all of the. Michael did this part. We counted all of the broken li links that we have that are our own content. So stuff under the customer portal, and there was like over four hundred thousand broken links as in this graph. Um, there might be more now, but um, after we apply all of the static redirects, it fixes almost all of them. The ones that are still broken are ones that we 
know are going to be broken because there's stuff like links to go to support cases and stuff like that, which we're not going to put in an offline container because it's that's dynamic, right? We only put we you have to like log in and enter like you can't do that stuff in offline. So so the remaining broken links are stuff that is supposed to be broken. Um, the way that we do this, and this is like this is important for anyone who wants to do offline stuff. Redirects can come from so many layers. You can have your edge CDN, your origin server, some sort of intermediate layer, your CMS. Um, and especially for sites that have been around for a long time, they're everywhere. Like link, redirects are a pain in the butt to track down where they come from. Um, so what we do is we like, well, we know all of the broken links. That we know because we can make a list of them when we scan through it with Rust. But, and so then we're like, well, we can follow each one of those. So every single broken link, Michael wrote this really cool, um, we called it head check, where he just makes a head request to that link. And if it's a 301, save the, the final destination. So then we have broken link, and then the final destination. And then we, do, we just basically search and replace everywhere for that link. And that way, in the end, anywhere where there's a redirect is now replaced with its actual link that it should go to. That's what we call static redirecting. Thank you. Um, the trans OK, so this is a, this is a cool part. Um, this is why we chose Rust, basically. One of, well, one of the main reasons why we chose Rust. Um, the, the parallelism, um, like the current concurrency of Rust is amazing, and it also uh, with certain libraries like Rayon, which is written by a redheader named Josh Stone, it's simply the matter of changing a function call. Like the standard iterator is just iterator. If you want to go over a collection in sequence, but if you want to do it in parallel, just make it a par iter. And now you've parallelized your loop with changing one function. It's, a, it's amazing, that kind of stuff. Um, and, it, and even if you're not using Rayon, Rust, like the standard Rust, makes it really powerful to do concurrency stuff. And in our transforms, that's what Michael did. Um, <clears throat> and this is just an example of like, it takes every single CPU resource we have and assigns it some of the, some of the files that it has to process. And then it, and those one, two, three, four, like those, those represents the transforms. So like, it takes a file and be like, opens the file. Apply all the transforms, writes the file out. Now that file's now that file is good to go for offline, but it does it across all of your resources. I'm going to show you a really cool example of this right now. Um, we're going to show you this working. So what I have here is so it's Tmux uh, HTOP on top, showing you all my CPUs, and I'm going to run the Mimir CLI. I'm going to run the transform. The, Ru the Rust-based CLI and run the transform on our full data set. It's over 200,000 files. And you're going to watch, watch what happens with the CPUs and watch how long it takes. Okay, so the Mimir CLI transform, here it goes. All the CPUs light up and it's done. That's 214,000 HTML files and markdown files that it just read applied transforms to, and then wrote out to the file system. And it did it in like five seconds. And the, by the way, the amount of content that it just went through was about uh, six gigabytes. And that's how fast it went. So amazing stuff. And that's, uh, credit, credit goes to Michael Clayton for that. All right, so let's keep going. Um, I did the live demo. OK, just as a comparison, if we tried to do the same kind of transform using a language like Node.js, which coming from the web world, there's a lot of Node.js, um, it would have taken seven hours. <laughs> we, did a, we did a proof of concept of like, let's run our transforms with Node.js uh, and, and single-threaded, because Node.js is the single-threaded language. And it, just, it would have taken an uh, like un, unacceptable amount of time. But with Rust, it's easy. So. All right, finally on to the load step. I'm going to speed up a little bit. In the load step, we, have our, we statically generate the site with a static site generator. So we have all those markdown files. Now they've been transformed. The static site generator is also Rust-based, 
called Zola, um, and because it can generate the soup faster than we did a evaluation that generates it like way faster than any other site generator we found. Once the site is generated, then we do the solar indexing, so we can have a search index that is in perfectly in sync with the content because it was just generated and now we have the solar index. Then we can apply customizations like, like unclassified banners, stuff like that. And then finally we wrap the whole thing in a, uh, we build the, a container with uh, image with Podman. Then build the single image container of Mimir. Uh, we did some size optimizations. We took the, so there's some, like we use SSI, because like you're generating hundreds of thousands of HTML files. Well, if you have like your header and footer duplicated hundreds of thousands of times, you're just wasting masses of amounts of space statically. So we use a really, an old, old standard in Apache called SSI, server side includes. Um, so anything common is in an include HTML file and it gets, and it gets injected on the server. Um, that saved gigabytes worth of space off of our final image. And then Michael also wrote a image optimization, which uh, takes J PNGs and JPGs and writes them to WebPs across the entire website. WebP is a much better format. It's, it saved three gigabytes of space just by converting PNGs to WebP. Um, in the end, and then also we use uh, Podman save to export the tar file. Yeah, and um, that was at the beginning uncompressed unless you explicitly say format OCI archive and then it compresses the tar file for you, like all the layers. Um, in the end, we took the, the image size from 16 gigabytes to 6 gigabytes. So we took off 10 gigabytes of space through these optimizations. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just mention this really fast. If you have premium content that you have to put into a container, there's no authentication because it's just static HTML. So if you have stuff that's behind a login, how do you secure that stuff with a static image? It's, it's really, you know, it's a weird problem to think about. Um, the way that we took care of that part was we encrypt all of the premium content that's behind a login at rest in the image that can only be decrypted on response time out of Apache using a decryption key that we give to the customer. So in the end, it's equivalent to they're having them using their username and password. It's about the same level of uh, security. Of course, they could share the key, but they could also share their username and password. So it's, it's about the same level of security. All right, so here's the common challenges and our solutions with offline. Uh, getting, getting data from many sources. Use GraphQL. It's a beautiful abstraction layer that you don't have to think about the data sources. You just only get what you want out of GraphQL. Um, Broken content. We need fast transforms using a language like Rust where you can parallelize it. Because you're going to definitely, definitely have broken content. And broken links. To fix broken links, apply static redirects by figuring out the redirects beforehand and then applying them to your, all your broken links. Container image size. You can use all of these optimization strategies like SSI, WebP conversion, gzipping stuff, um, only including certain amount of content that you want. And then the updates part, it's a single container image. So because we spent so much time on the performance aspects of it, uh, the, <clears throat> the, we did that so that we can build images very fast and on, on demand. So we have a pipeline, a build image pipeline, that could run multiple times per day. So if, if the customer has a way of taking, pulling the image, and then transferring it to wherever their offline site is, is since our builds are fast, our image is small, we can provide fast updates. That's, what, that's why we do that. All right, so um, I, I, I know we're out of time. Uh, I wanted to, uh, so we have like uh, a super quick demo, and there's, we have a little bit of flexibility. So if anyone wants to see like a super quick demo, Oh yeah, we're the, okay. Okay, so my super quick demo. This is going to be a live, so be live. So, let's go.
Um, I'm actually connected to the Red Hat VPN right now. So um, I'm going to first, uh, the, the transform that I just did, I'm going to clean it up. And then I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that whole, so we did, I talked about ETL. I'm going to do, an, from the beginning to the end, the extract, transform, and load phase, but with a small sample size, because I'm not going to do the entire customer portal over this Wi-Fi and make you guys wait. Uh, it's fast, but it does take about 15 minutes. So what I'm going to do instead is do a, um, a small sample size, which is I'm going to extract 10, that's the sample size, of just solutions. Solutions is what comes out of our knowledge base. And CVEs, 10 solutions, 10 CVEs, and I'm going to set a concurrency of two. So this is the extract. I can increase it or decrease the concurrency. Um, and what it's doing right now is it's doing the extract. So it's going out to GraphQL. Well, first, we also, we also cache a bunch of stuff so we don't have to re-download the entire CVE database. We only download them if, if they've been updated or new ones have been added. Um, but now the extract is done. So it extract 10 solutions, it's 10 CVEs, but it got the CVEs out of a cache that we have. Now the extract is done. So now we do the transform, which it was a small amount of content, so it, it's pretty much instantly. And now we do the load, which does the site generation. Um, and the load can take options. Dash R is to apply the redirects that I talked about. Um, uh, S is to generate the solar search index. P, uh, P is to generate uh, the Podman image. And I put an F on there, which adds some like feedback buttons. It's like a customization at the end. So, it did, so the, the site got generated. Uh, it applied the redirects as spinning past. It was, there wasn't many files. Uh, it finished the solar index. And now it's doing the Podman image build. And now we're, now we're done. So now we can run it with the, now this is, this is, the, this is for the next part. But this is the, the image I just built, Mimir latest. So now it's running. This, so, like I, this is the appliance part, right? Simple Podman run, and that's it. Now I go to a. Now I go to my local host, and there, there it is running. This is the Mimir home. This is the homepage of the offline that we just built. Ten. So you notice we only selected solutions and CVEs. So there's only solutions and CVEs here. If I go to the about, you'll see there's ten solutions, ten CVEs. And we've got SolarWorks, because this is actually part of the search index. This is a solution. And you also see, since it's statically generated, you see how fast those pages are loaded, loading for a web page? That's like, uh, that's like so fast, you're like, wait, something must be wrong here. Like, how is that loading so fast? So um, all right, so that's the small sample size. Now, now watch this. I have internet. I'm going to turn off my internet. I've got no internet, right? So I could go to DevConf, no internet. If I come, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill the current running container and then do the last. This is the last part. This is the full image running. And now I have no internet, right? But still everything works. And I can come on here. I can search like firewall, CMD. Oh, Oh, uh, how to open port. And then, boom, like, if you're offline, you're like, hey, I don't know how to open a firewall port. Well, here is the exact commands you need to open your firewall port. And I did that without any internet. So that is the power of that. So I think we're totally out of time. <laughs> I apologize for not leaving more time for questions. But um, if you have questions, you can definitely come talk to me or blast a meal after, but thank you.